What's up folks, this is Tim and today I want to show you how to rasterize an image with processing. This is the sketch we are going to build. This is an image, this one, this is the source image and the algorithm just rasterizes this image. So this is pretty much fun I think and it's a really nice way to um, explain why processing is interesting and how it works. Cool, so um, maybe let's just start out with the uh, explanation of what processing is and why it is interesting. Well, processing, um, maybe you heard of it, it's in programming environment, it's a software you can download on the internet, it's free. Um, this is how it looks, it's a code editor and it's also a dedicated, um, well, it's, it's a programming environment with a dedicated code editor and you can write pretty amazing interactive things with it. These things are called sketches inside of the processing world, so everybody's, if, when I say sketch I mean processing application, so um, this is pretty amazing. Why is pro processing so amazing? Because it is made for artists and designers, so the people behind processing in you know, they just wanted to make a very accessible tool that makes it easy to create interactive visuals and interactive applications. You can literally use it for any use case. So if you are an architect, if you are an artist or graphic designer or web developer or whatever, for all of these professions, processing will bring a lot of, um, well, learnings to you that are very valuable. I started to work with processing because I was hooked by the versatility and the you know the convenience of writing code and processing really makes it interesting and playful and, and creative to to work with programming. Cool. Every single sketch in processing consists of two very fundamental functions and these functions are called setup and draw, right? Setup and draw. The setup function, this is how we just use it in processing, is the place where you put all the information about the document. It's like, you know, when you have worked with InDesign before, um, it is like the new document uh, dialogue where it asks you for the size and, you know, what kind of document it should be for the web or for print or whatever. So this is the place where we put all these informations. Later on, we will add more informations to the setup function, but for now, it's just important for you that we can define the size of the sketch here. Let's say 500 times 500 pixels, all right? Cool. So the second part of each processing application is void draw. Draw is the place in every single processing sketch which uh, defines what shall happen over time. So this defines what kind of animation should be drawn on the sketch window. So let's start out by drawing a, a white background. The 255 represents white. Why? Well, the range between zero, which defines which represents black, and 255 is, uh, you know, the range of gray shades we have in processing to draw something in grayscale. So now I write a function called fill. Fill says everything that follows shall be shall have a, diff, a specific color. In this case, I would say black. So fill everything black that follows up. So, and then I say something like no stroke, which says that I don't want to have a stroke. I use the ellipse function to draw an ellipse onto the screen. And this is the position I define, mouse X and mouse Y. That means draw the ellipse at the mouse position. So, cool. Um, now, let's say the ellipse should be 60 times 60 pixels. That should be the size of the ellipse. And let's run the sketch. By the way, I'm just using the this, this button here to run the sketch. It appears on the wrong display. That's why I have to put it over here. So now I have a sketch where um, a circle follows the mouse. All right, that's fantastic. Um, there's another function I want to show you here. It's called random, and random generates a random number. So let's say a random number in, inside of a specific range. So if you say random 0, comma, width, and here 0, comma, height, which are both predefined variables in processing. Let's maybe just scale the window a bit to see everything. Uh, then we will have an ellipse 
at random positions on our sketch window, right? So if I run the sketch now, again, it will appear here on the wrong screen. Let's say maybe I can adjust this in the in the settings. I'm pretty sure that's possible. Ta -da. Uh, yes, I think that's possible. All right. Again, let's start the sketch. There we go. Cool. That's the wrong sketch. This is the right sketch. So there we go. So now we've got an ellipse um, that appears on the sketch window. And the thing is that the draw function, as I told you, this is the place which where we define what shall happen over time. So the draw function is executed 30 times a second. Right? This is like, in, you know, it has a frame rate. So we can define the frame rate in, in the setup to tell it which speed it should have. So the frame rate 1, for example, would execute only once per um, per second. So now every second an ellipse is generated. I could also say that it should be 10. So now, you know, every second 10 times uh, a new circle would be generated on the screen. Um, yeah, so that's how random works. Random is a powerful function to, um, you know, create generative visuals, by the way. Okay, so let's move on here and go to the next um, thing. Let's go to images. Let's talk about images. So first of all, we should talk about variables. What is a variable? Well, the processing sketch has something like a memory. It can memorize things. If we tell it that, for example, if we tell a sketch that Tim, that's me, is 34 years old, then we can define that in a variable, right? So we could say int, which says integer is a, you know, it's a full number without a comma, without a floating point value. Int age is equal to 34. So now processing would know um, that my age is 34. We, so we could use my age now here, for example, to define the size, oops, of the ellipse, would, which doesn't make any sense, but you know, that's how variables work, right? So the sketch knows that age is equal to 34. We also could say something like string, which says, which represents a text. Let's call it text, string text equals to, hey, internet. So now processing knows that there is a text called text, right? Um, that that is, hey, internet. We could use this text now, but we won't because this is not about text and typography, which is a huge topic, a very interesting topic. Um, but for now, we will skip that and go over to a more complex variable type called p image, which say, stands for processing image. Because we are going to rasterize an image, as I already told you, right? So we could say something like image equal to uh, load image parentheses. So here we, we could define the name of an image file. Well, processing sketches can have data, can have font files and image files that they just, you know, that they have access to. And all you have to do to do this, to make these files accessible to the processing application is choosing an image, dragging it over the editor and uh, dropping it. So now it is inside of the processing sketch. Well, you did, you have no visual feedback here and you don't see that something happened, but something happened. Let me show you what. So if you go to sketch and then you go to show sketch directory, you will see that there is, this is the sketch um, folder, by the way, I just saved this to my desktop. Otherwise, probably I will just, you know, mess this up. Let's call it toot. Okay, so again, let's go to show sketch directory, and here we've got the sketch directory, right? And there's a tut.pde, which is a processing sketch file, and there is a data folder. And the data folder is where processing stores the image file, which we now can use throughout the sketch. We have no access to these files inside of the, inside of the uh, data folder, right? Woo, okay, cool. Uh, so the name of the image is venus.jpg. And now through the uh, image function, right, we load the image into our sketch. We, 
you know, we now have access to this image. We can now say image parentheses and image is a function to draw an image to uh, to the sketch window um, and could say something like, well, which image should it draw? Well, the image is defined through the variable img, right? So this is the variable where the image is stored in. So we can do, say that the image function should draw the image called img and let's say we want to move it with the mouse. All right, let's run the sketch and see what happens. So it's pretty large, right? The image is super large at the moment. So um, that's because processing just loads the image in its whole resolution. What we can do now is we can say image.resize in, in this uh, setup function. Something like, well, let's say 50 and 50. So now we have a very tiny image here. <laughs> as you can see right so we can uh, yeah well now this image is placed with the mouse position well you know that's not a interest well that could be interesting by the way here's something cool just you know just a fun fact if you just uh, uncommand the background function then you can draw with the image can you see that that's an interesting effect. Why is that happening? Well, because processing is not clearing what has been drawn onto, this, onto the sketch window before. So if you don't tell it to clear the window by saying paint the background white again, every time it goes through the draw loop, every frame, right, uh, then it won't do that and we will have this effect. But that's just a side note here. Um, you can play with this later on if you like. All right, cool. Uh, so we don't, we don't want to draw an image because we don't want to draw this image. We want to uh, analyze the image, get the pixel data out of it, and then draw ellipses on a grid that represent the, the, the brightness values, right? So the brighter a value is in the image, the smaller the black ellipse gets. That's what we want to do. Okay, these are quite a few steps, but let's try to get through it, through them. Cool. Um, why don't we get, well, I think it makes sense to get back to the ellipse example from a few minutes ago. So let's say ellipse random with, so that means draw an ellipse. Um, let's so that we tell processing to draw an ellipse at this position, so random width and random height. So at any x position, at any y position of the sketch, and the size of the, of the ellipse should be, let's say, 30, all right? Again, sketch is running, you know, it's drawing 10 times a frame, 10 times a second, it's drawing an ellipse on the screen. By the way, the standard frame rate is 30, so if I just delete that, it will draw 30 times a second. Right? Cool. What if we want to say, do this 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, 10,000 times? And this is where the magic of generative design comes into the play, because here we can create the systems that don't, you know, we just have to write the instructions, but we can tell processing to execute something very, very often, as often as we want, as often as our computer can manage it, because some, some, at some um, amount it will just... Uh, lose performance, but well, how can we how can we do that by saying for int i equals zero? Don't get overwhelmed. Relax, relax. It's I'm not going to write something that you won't understand. It will be overwhelming a bit at first, but believe me, this is going to be very very convenient later on. Okay, so you don't have to worry about that for now. Just follow me. <laughs> so. Um, I is smaller than, let's say, uh, 10, I++. Plus plus. This, what I wrote here, says that the ellipse here should be drawn 10 times every single frame, every time the draw loop is executed. So, the frame rate is, think about that, 30. It's the standard frame rate of processing, 30. So, the ellipse will be drawn 10 times every frame, 30 times a second. Let's see how that actually looks in real. Bam! Confetti rain. 
Um, cool. So let's change that to 100 and see what happens now. As you can see, it's getting more dense, right? It's getting more density. So there are more ellipses drawn onto the, more circles drawn onto the sketch window. So 1000 will probably, well, fill the whole area and we don't just have these little spots that are white. So, and 10,000 will probably, yeah, it will be only black. That's how for loops work. A for loop is a way to say that something should be executed more than once. So everything you have to, all you have to care about here is not, you know, that's not really interesting, I think. Um, I will go through it and explain you what it means because it defines basically how the for loop should behave. But all you have to care about at the moment is this number because this number defines which amount or how often we want to go through the loop. All right, cool. Um, what if we would like to draw ellipses in a row? Okay, so next to each other. That's no problem. We can do that easily. Let's say the Y position, and by the way, let me quickly just show you this. So this is X and Y, you know, these are the two positions. The first parameter defines the X position of the ellipse. The second parameter defines the Y position of the ellipse. That's how uh, the ellipse function works. So what if we want to have, a, uh, we want to draw these ellipses in a row? Well, that's not super hard. Let's say, um, the y position should be height divided by 2, which means that it will be positioned at the middle of the sketch. Makes sense, right? Height divided by 2 is the middle of the sketch. And the x position, now it's get, it gets interesting, is i. And if we do that, let's just draw 100 ellipses instead, because that will be, would show us what, what, uh, what's going on here. So, you know, there's, these are ellipses 100 ellipses on top of each other why well because you know the i this is the most interesting part if you want to work with uh, for loops the i is a variable that goes that goes um, from 0 to 100 the first iteration of the of the for loop it is 0 the second iteration of the for loop the second time um, you know every iteration this code will be executed the second one it will be 1 the third one, it will be two. The fourth one, it will be four, uh, three. The fifth one, it will be four. It is difficult because it's always minus one. But, you know, the variable i just adds up every iteration. So until it reaches 100 and then the follow up is done, right? So this will execute until i is larger than 100 or equal to 100. We also could say something like i plus equal to. That will say, would say that we would add 2 to i every iteration of the for loop. That means we would iterate through this for loop 50 times. Right? So, okay, this is pretty difficult and a bit mathy. I don't want to overwhelm you with that stuff, so I just want you to have fun. I want you to enjoy what you do here, because this is really enjoyable. Trust me. <laughs> um, yeah, so how to get rid of that problem that these ellipses are just on top of each other? Well, we could say something like i times 10, for example. So the step from one ellipse to the other will be 10. Or we could say something like i times, let's say, 50, right? So now you can see that the ellipses are next to each other, right? One ellipse, next ellipse, next ellipse. So that's a for loop, right? We tell processing to do something 100 times here, we can, can see all the, uh, the, these uh, ellipses because, because they are just out of, the, out of the sketch window, but basically it is drawing 100 ellipses in a row. Cool. So um, to make this a little bit more understandable, maybe I have to explain why did I call this variable i? Because that's a convention, you know, that's just how people call variables in loops. I would rename it to x because we are... Um, with this variable, we are only manipulating the x-axis. So if I just change the name of the variable to x, it will still work. Well, what 
if we would like to say that we don't want to have ellipses only on the x-axis, but also on the y-axis of the sketch window. So then we would have a grid of ellipses, right? How to draw a grid? Well, maybe you already guess it, but to draw a grid in processing, we need to nest the loop. That means we need to add one more loop into the other. This won't work because we cannot define the variable x twice. So I would propose to call this variable y. Hmm, <laughs> Makes sense, right? And now we have a for loop that um, draws 10,000 ellipses. Maybe we should reduce this to 10 because that makes more sense. Um, so now it draws 100 ellipses, 10 times 10, because every time this for loop is uh, running, we do the other for loop, the nested for loop, 10 times. So we are drawing 100 ellipses, right? So how would that look like? Well, we cannot see anything. Why? Because the ellipses are just stacked on top of each other. That means here are now 10 ellipses on top of each other, and we cannot see them in... They are not moving, they are not, you know, they are not, um, they have no offset or something. So, what we could do, we could say the ellipse y position should be y times 50, for example. Let's see how that looks. Ta-da! Can you see that? We've got a proper grid here. And by the way, this is a coincidence that it just fits, <laughs> because 50... No, uh, let's think about that. Well, the size of the sketch is 500, and we are going through it. Um, we are just offsetting the ellipses by 50, so it adds, it sums up to 500, so it just fits into the grid or into the size of the sketch window. That's a nice coincidence. Um, cool. We've got a grid here. So, anyway, that's what we wanted, right? We wanted to scan an image and uh, go through it um, well, and draw a grid of, of, of the, on top of the image and scan the pixels to learn which color value these pixels have and convert them into brightness values that control the size of the ellipses. That's one step too far. First, I would like to set the loop, uh, no, set, set up the grid and make it more dynamic. What if, if I wanted to say that I would like to change the number of grid tiles, so cells or tiles or however I would call these things for tiles from now, every single, every single item in the grid is a tile, right? What if we would like to define that they should be dynamic? Well, we could do so by saying something like this, float tiles equal to mouse x for example right uh, but mouse x you know is a value between 0 and 500 and 500 would be pretty much and this would slow down our sketch and pro it, it, maybe it would just break um, let's say mouse x divided by 10 so now ah of course so <laughs> yes you know I just Schiffman always says something like, here's the thing. So I, I wanted to say, here's this thing, but I don't want to copy Schiffman because I re respect him and his videos so much. Um, and uh, I don't want to say, here's, here's the thing. I try to avoid that. But here's the thing. <laughs> um, we've got now a variable called tiles, and it defines how many tiles should be on the grid. Um, and the thing is that I can replace the number 10 with the tiles variable, which is now dynamic, which defines how many tiles should be drawn. So now if I move the mouse on the screen, I can, you can see uh, I'm just, you know, uh, changing the, the amount of tiles drawn onto the sketch window. Great. All righty. If I would like to have the tiles distributed on the sketch window, how to do that? Well, that's super easy. Float tile size, that's how, how I just simply call the variable, is equal to tiles divided by, no, sorry, with divided by tiles. And now we can say that the 
that we want to multiply x and y each iteration by tile size. And look at this, what happens now. Ta-da! Can you see that? We've got a proper grid. Well, it's a bit annoying that the grid is not starting at the right position because, you know, as you can see, it's just like offset it a bit to the left. That's because we could fix that quickly by using the translate function. Parentheses, parentheses, and then tile size divided by two. Tile size divided by two. We are just shifting the whole grid a little bit to the right. And th so now it will be appropriate into the inside of the uh, sketch window. Nice. Can you see that? Great, isn't it? Cool. Um, fantastic. So that was, from my perspective, that was the most difficult part because it's really, it's a lot of math and it's a lot of thinking and logic but if you understand a loop and if, if you understand the grid ones this is going to repeat over and over and over and over again in every single processing sketch so these are essential uh, you know this is essential now how you can use in any programming language loops are everywhere every programming language has loops in there all right so now we should start to to work with the image to yeah, to scan the image, the brightness values of the image. So now we are going to pick the color of the image. So um, we, we just want to have want to know which brightness value or how dark this gray is in, at this position, so that we can decide how large the ellipse should be in the end. Um, and by the way, let me quickly show you this again. So as you can see, the ellipses are generated through the brightness and darkness values of the image. So that's how this effect comes to life. Cool, so what we have to do, we have to pick out the color out of the image at the appropriate position, right? And convert it into a brightness value, which we will later on convert into a size. We are very close now, we are very, very close to the end of this tutorial. And I'm just, you know, we are just three steps away from that. So the next thing we have to do, again, we have to pick out the color, that's what we do by um, using the uh, color variable type. I call it C and I will use the IMG variable, which is the image, by the, again, right here is the place where we just said that IMG should be the venus.jpg image. And we use the get function to get a specific pixel out of the, or a specific color out of the image. And now I put an X and a an Y in here. And now it gets the pixel um, from X and Y. This won't work because now we are going, you know, we are not really going through the image at the moment. We are going through the grid, which has a specific amount of tiles. So to get the right pixel and not just one from the uh, top left corner, we have to multiply x times tile size. And this is a bit confusing, but this is going to return a floating point value. But when we want to get a pixel from an array, I know this sounds like magic for you. This is very overwhelming. But you know, you will see what happens when I'm just finished uh, putting that code together here. So. I just have to, to use the int function to convert a floating point value back to, a, to an integer uh, times tile size. Okay, so have no fear, <laughs> no worries. This is going to be very simple in the end. And so this line of code here picks the right pixel from the image, right? It picks the color from the image at a specific position. Now, the thing is, a color is always an RGB value, but we want to have a one grayscale value that we, can, that we can convert into the size of the circles. So what we have to do now is um, creating a floating point value. Let's call it B, no, let's call it size equal to brightness, which is a, um, a function that converts a color into a brightness value. And uh, there we go. 
that should be it. There's still one bug in there, and we won't see anything now because everything would be will be black. There's something not really working. Ah, okay. Well, it was the fact that the size was too big, too large. Uh, well, the thing is, the brightness function returns a value between zero and 255. What we have to do now, we have to map the range between zero and 255 to a new range, which is between zero, which says the size of the ellipse should be zero when the color is white, to let's say 20. And we can do so by using the map function. Surprise. So map brightness C, this is the value we wanna, we wanna convert. And um, it starts, this is the source value range. It is from zero to 255. We want to map it to a range from zero to 20, right? Here we go. Now we can use the variable size to there's something wrong, man. There's something wrong. Let me think about that. I mean, here's still a bug in the in the code. As you can remember, in the beginning of the tutorial, I was playing around with the image, and it was 50 times 50 pixels, right? Can you remember when I just scaled it down to show how to scale an image? The values were still set to 50 and 50, but I need the image to be 500 times 500 to wrap over the whole sketch window. So if I run the sketch now, come on, what's wrong? Uh, syntax error, maybe a missing semicolon. Okay, I needed a bit to find out what's wrong here, but it is like, you know, it's just yelling at me and telling me that, you know, this is, by the way, this is the debugger. You will spend a lot of time fixing these errors. That's what programming is about. And it, it's, it's telling me that there's a syntax error that means there's something that is wrong with my syntax, and syntax is the way how you write your code. Uh, it says maybe a missing semicolon, but I can't, I can't see any, any place where I just, this is the semicolon, where I just uh, forget, forgot that. So what I always do then is to put the size function on top of setup. That is important to know that the size function is mostly, it should be, the first function that is run from setup. Otherwise, it can drop some ugly errors. And now, ta-da, you can see, I am just getting the rasterizer effect here. Great, right? Um, cool. So what's wrong here? The image is inverted. Can you see that? It's inverted. It's not really how I just wanted to have it. I, I wanted to have it, uh, well, now the, the bright values um, are black and the dark values are dark. No, that's bullshit. <laughs> um, it's just inverted. So what I can do here is just saying 20, just reversing these values here inside of the map function, the, the, the last two values. Great, so I just reverse the values, and now if I run the function, I get what I expected. Here is the visual I wanted to have, right? So, isn't it nice? What I can now do, some fine tuning, putting the tile size variable in here, and now I get a proper scaling of these circles. They will no, never overlap because the maximum size of each tile is uh, the tile size, right? The defined val variable. So they will never overlap. So basically that's it. That's the uh, end of this tutorial. But I just want to point out here that processing is able to save any file format you can imagine. So you can export GIF animations. You can export movies in any resolution, in any size. You can export images, you know, SVG graphics, PDF files. Um, OBJ data, you know, 3D objects, anything. So that's what makes processing so super powerful. Thank you so much for watching and all the best for you. Enjoy, have a nice day and bye bye.